Hey everybody, Karthik Subramaniam over at Adi Schools. We're here at the State Restaurant in Rancho Cucamonga. I have a very special guest today. I have Robert L. Adams, the broker owner of Lawyers Realty Brokerage here with us. Good morning, uh, everybody. Yeah, Robert is a, a successful real estate broker here in Rancho Cucamonga, and I came to visit him today, wanted to grab some lunch, and I wanted to share his journey in the great real estate business with all of you guys. This is gonna be a good one. Stay tuned for a little more. Hey Robert, thanks a lot for meeting with me today. I appreciate it. We've known each other, I think, probably what, 20 years now? It's going on 20, getting yeah, close. Long, a long time. I met him when I was three. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, Robert has a very interesting story. We uh, met probably, I'm gonna say, yeah, about 15, 16 years ago. We both worked at a Prudential California Realty office in Ontario for a mentor to both of us. And uh, how'd you get started in the real estate business? Um, I got Great. licensed in 1988. <laughs> So that goes back a ways, back before the iPhone, before the fax, uh, we had books. So I was in college, a friend of mine said, you should try getting your real estate license. You could work part time and go to school, do your homework at the office during uptime, which might be a thing of the past. And basically one thing led to the next, I uh, went full time, right out the gate, and uh, I enjoyed it. So the market was good in 87, 88 when you got in? Right, we were in a upswing. Uh, but we it tanked a few years after that, right? 91. 91. 91. Okay. Did you, you went through that recession? I went then? through that one. You, and you it was it tough. <laughs> well, that was a baby recession compared to what happened in 2007. Okay. So, you know, the market was going up. I was brand new. Right. And literally, I would hear stories of, I just bought a house in Diamond Bar. And you know, 10 months later, I sold the house and made $80,000. So you hear those stories or people walking in. It's kind of like now. <laughs> right. Well, on a much smaller scale because you didn't, you didn't feel the tension. Okay. You, it just felt like, okay, people are buying homes, I'm selling homes, right. and I'm looking for ways to capture clients. It's funny because one of our mentors actually, uh, this guy Bruce Mulhern, who's still around, he has like 2,000 agents that work for him. The first week that we were there, or that I was there on the training with Bruce, he passed out this article from the Long Beach Press Telegram, and he still has it. It was like from 1998, and it was a person who, older woman, I think her name was like Joe Bissell or something. I don't know if you saw that article. I don't remember her name, but I know the article. Yeah. I tell that story. Yeah, where like at the time mm -hmm. she was like renting a house in Newport Beach for like 400 bucks a month, like the 1960s. But to buy the house, maybe the payment would have been like 500 a month. And she goes, "Oh, I'll just stay here and rent." And then several years later, no, no, right? Her, 33 years later. 33 years later, right? A long time later. The rent had gone up so much that she, she was retired. forced to, yeah, she'd retired and she'd forced to relocate. And he tells that story about the certainty of owning a home because your payment's not going to go up, it's going to be fixed. So that always, that, that story always yeah, stuck with me. her rent at that time was about 3500 a month and she was going to have to relocate because she could not afford the rent. Yeah, right, right. I was think about that story and think, man, you gotta, you got to own your own home, right? Just so you have certainty and you have, you know, a 30-year fixed loan and you don't have to worry about you know, you have to worry about anything, at least the, the payment going up. Well, three things happen, and I talk about this in my buying seminars and also in the training. Number one, when you buy a home, even if the payment is higher, regardless, on a 30-year fixed FHA or conventional, you automatically lock your payment in for the life of the loan. You're right. You'll never get another rent increase. Number two, you pay the loan down. After 30 years, the loan goes away, there's no payment. Right. Hopefully while you're entering retirement. And number three, of course, is there is appreciation. It's not something you should gamble with, but it is pretty consistent, seven to eight percent over the last 50, 60 years in California. Yeah. So you'll get that also. So, you know, I think all of us have been that have been in real estate for a period, you know, felt the re felt the recession pretty hard, 2008 through 2012. How do, how was that time for you in your in your business? Because just to talk about maybe your journey from like maybe 1999 to 2000. <laughs> From 19, perfect. Right. <laughs> Does that answer the question? <laughs> right. No, obviously That's frightening, but go on. Having lived through, okay, being in the real estate industry, people who lived in the Great Depression, my grandmother was one of those people. They wouldn't throw food away after dinner. They would save what's called the leftovers. Right. Having gone through that experience, it could change you for life. Being in the real estate industry, I would say that was. That was definitely one of those experiences for me, my family, and a lot of other agents that I know. Just to summarize it, there were brokers with 100 plus agent offices that are no longer in the business. There are people that lost everything they had 
uh, my family included. We, you know, were making huge sums of money and it suddenly came to a halt. It was one of the biggest real estate crashes in, in history for the United States. So to go through that and have that story to tell and to be on, to be in front of it, making 40, 50 sales a year, where prices were averaging in our market about $600,000 per. So that that is earned gross commission income of what, 700,000 bucks? I mean, Anywhere from, yeah, from four to seven, okay. you know, depending on. Which what, is a yeah. insane living by any standard, right? Three quarters of a million dollars right. a year and, almost for half a million a year. And, and then to go immediately within 12 months to making less than a hundred because the system was frozen. Mm -hmm. Basically short sales and repos hit the market. It was a distressed uh, properties market where everything was some sort of default, either a short sale, which could take up to a year to close. Um, REOs, which also had a, a different process. You had to wait for the people who weren't making their payment to be evicted, the bank to take the property back. And then when they would hit the market, um, buyers trying to buy them and, and deal with a whole new uh, method where in, prior to that, agents would talk to each other. You'd have someone representing a family that had some sort of needs, they had their emotional you know, uh, perspective. To go to uh, in, uh, entity owned property that was maybe back east and not care about anything, right. more of a, the, the process of the paperwork and the detachment really was a change. And I right. like to also point out that that market had what we call two to three entry exit points, right? A buyer buying a home may have sold a home. They also, the seller may be buying another home, so you had different uh, stages. Right. In that market, it was predominantly a one-point entry exit, meaning if I was short selling, I wasn't buying another home, I was just going to rent somewhere. Yeah. The buyers usually coming in weren't selling anything, so it was just a one-in or one-out transaction. Yeah, so you made half the money, basically. Right? Well, not only that, it, the relationship in the during the transaction was different. So agents weren't used to following up with their clients. I mean, short sell sellers, you know, this kind of went away. Yeah, right. And so the agent who came in in 08, 09, 10, 11, came in at a different time with a different perspective right. and are probably learning right now how to how to market a property and, and care for the agent on several transactions to continue the relationship like it should be um, versus just a one and done. Well, a lot of people getting into the business now, it's funny, they like, don't have a concept of how bad it was for a lot of real estate agents from 2008 through 2012. So uh, people that are get, taking our classes now or getting into the business now are kind of seeing it from the opposite perspective, right? Because it's pretty easy to sell a property right now. Average marketing times for most areas are under 30 days. So it's definitely an easier time to, to sell real estate if you have a listing. Whereas, you know, people that got in, as you said, in 2008, 2009, also have a different perspective having gone through a, a pretty pretty severe recession. Um, back when 88, 89, it was a, a more personable, you know, relationship. Right. Uh, industry where you would have to meet people face to face. Even agents, we would actually take the offer that we wrote on a house go meet the listing agent with the seller, sit at a kitchen table and present the offer. Talk yeah. about our clients, talk about why they should accept our offer, right, at least right. do business with us. With the invention or the advent of the fax, bringing that into play, cell phones, and agents working remotely more so than before, the contact between the agents much less, the interaction between buyer and seller a lot less. Well, there's and no interaction, right? I think for, with the buyer and the seller. They do bump into each yeah. other. They yeah, see each randomly, other, but, but, like, yeah, but it's 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 a lot less uh, of a social connection. Right. With social media trying to connect everybody, there's less of a connection in our industry, right. which I find out ironic. Right. Part of what a lot of people may or may not know about you is that you started with this pretty. Uh, almost from zero, right? After you uh, got out of college and uh, you know left Cal Poly, you kind of really started from zero and then went from literally making no money to making 700,000 bucks, probably in a span of what, five years, five years maybe? Timeline's off a little bit. Okay. Okay, so out of, in Cal Poly mm -hmm. is 1988, 89, and I was 20, 21. And the market was okay. I was starting to get some traction, but then we hit the recession from 91. And I did loans, bounced around, 
had some ups and downs, um, some personal issues mm -hmm. that I developed, and I'll share with you guys that. Um, so anyways, the market though was kind of flat, at least for me personally. I mean, there were good times. We'd have spurts, but uh, the market started surging again in 98. So 98, 99 is where I met uh, my mentor, Bruce Mulhern, and right shortly thereafter met you. But the market was coming back around, uh, another hot you know, market of the 2000s. And so I was going to 12-step meetings, recovering from drugs and alcohol, um, had bottomed out, lived at home, um, you know, basically had to start over from less than zero. You know, coming out of college and having zero is one thing, but you do have opportunity, optimism, energy, youth. However, falling down and suffering a personal setback is a little bit tougher. It's right. probably one of the biggest challenges in my life. So anyways, met my uh, current wife, um, you know, her and things kind of aligned. I had a, an aha moment in you know, basically got on track right. two years later after, in 99, riding the bus to work in the real estate business. Which, yeah. which I, is not a good look. Yeah, right? Not a good look. <laughs> Looking for people to partner with just right. so you could service the clients. Right. Um, living at home, going to treatment, you know, three days, three days a week. Right. And finding a partner that's willing to drive you down to the, to your meetings. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. somebody was smiling, you know. Yeah. Uh, on me at that time and uh, then it was up to me to put the work in. Two years later, number two agent in the company of uh, about 1400 at the time, uh, making about 350 in commissions and that's net to me. Right. So probably four, 450 gross. Um, and for all the viewers out there, I was on an 80% split with a franchise fee on top of that and I didn't think twice about it. Um, it was about the sell. It's not always about the money, just a little side note. Which by the way, I, I can't tell you how many of our students, you know, will do like one deal or two deals and they'll call me and say, you know, I'm on a 75% split, I want a 90% split, I just closed one deal, how, do, how should I negotiate with my broker? I'm thinking, you've done one deal, right? Like, how, you have to earn, I think, it means more if you, I'm not saying you should give your money away, but I mean, you know, things come with time, you can't, it's that old saying, you can't produce uh, a baby in a month by getting nine women pregnant. It's just things take time. You know, you have to. You have to. That's a new one. Uh -oh. Can I borrow that? You, you, I got that from Warren Buffett. But if you want to use it, that's okay. that's fine. Yeah. So um, one of the, the the most blaringly obvious themes that jumps out is the passion for the work. Right. So people coming in, yes, it's a good living, but the money's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. You can't come in and focus on the money because you'll never develop. The, your service and product, which is you, right. correctly, because your your focus is on the the end result, which is the paycheck. The paycheck comes by giving good service, being a uh, a professional, and honing your craft. So, if you're not focused on what is the, the, your perspective, should be focused on the number of transactions, reaching the consumer, winning the client over because you offer a good product, which is good service, and understanding your market then you'll always be chasing the commission check. The commission check should just be a byproduct, should be an afterthought. Reaching people, servicing your clients should be a priority. Building a better system. If you're overworked and you have a lot of leads, then are you servicing the leads or are you wasting them? And training people to work with you when you need it, not just because you want it and you don't want to do any work. So we talked about basically your career from starting at uh, in the 80s to the 90s and then how you powered through this last recession. Talk about the company you've built now and where you want that company to go over the next, I don't know, let's say 10 to 15 years. Interesting question. We have seen dramatic changes in the industry. And when I speak to new agents or even agents that are you know within the last five to 10 years, we talk about the changes. Um, the consumer has online content. They have access to data which they didn't used to have. The realtor's purpose was to inform the consumer of the market. Well now, everybody has a website, everything is online, so people are seeing homes for sale as they come on, instantaneously, sometimes before you. So now our role has changed. Now that they have access to the data, our role is to interpret the data and give them good advice, which means you need to be more knowledgeable and more and have more in-depth knowledge of the industry, how it works, financing, economics, uh, stuff like that, versus just being able to let them in a home. 
So our new company that we just started two years ago and uh, for the first year was a filling out process. Uh, we have um, interesting components to the management team and to the company itself. I try to incorporate all the good things that I've learned from my previous companies. Uh, we do special hard money loans for agents and times to, to help generate business, which I borrow from my mentor. Um, I think that's a great asset for a real estate company to have. But also, online engagement with the consumer. It's, it's like the universe, you know, it's space. And we know it's out there, but we don't know what's out there. And so agents and real estate you know, people in the industry, right now we're seeing a rush. Uh, digital marketing people, social media marketing people, all trying to sell realtors this service so they can use it to engage in the, with the consumer. Because most of us, that's not our forte. And the average realtor, I believe, is 53 years old nationwide. So if you're comparing someone in my age group and your age group to 30s, someone that's in their 20s, our perspective on how we engage with you know people and, and consumers in the market is different. So we have to adapt to it. It's changing and it's not going back. So social media, websites, online lead generation is a must. The problem is there are big tech companies that have gotten there first and that's their forte. So they figured out they can develop companies that will capture leads, capture the consumer and then funnel them to the agent and pay them. They're called aggregators, Zillow, Trulio, and the, and the big Redfin. These companies that basically capture consumers online with our day, data through the MLS and turn around and sell these consumers who are searching to the realtors right. for money. So um, understanding how you can bypass that and still engage the consumer, capture them online. When I say capture them, I mean capture their attention span to put your proposal of service in front of them because they have a choice. They could use a realtor either that they know, someone that they don't know yet, they're shopping around. They're going to want a realtor to guide them through the process because it's a very, very, it's a big emotional buy. It's complicated. It's a legal document. So they still want a professional that could guide them to make sure they're making the right decision and keep them out of trouble during the process. Um, so we've built a platform for that and uh, then good old fashioned rolling up your sleeves and working prospect of teaching people how to engage the client, understanding what they need from you as their realtor and teaching them that so they'll be prepared to uh, get the best service possible. So notice what Robert's accomplished. Robert really has literally gone from less than zero to now having a large real estate company with his own mortgage company, his own escrow company, a brokerage, and he has uh, 50 plus agents that work for him. He's trying to get to over 100. If you want to talk to Robert and get in touch with him, his information's here at the bottom of the screen. I would definitely follow him on Facebook or Instagram and uh, you know get in touch. And He's really been a great friend to me over the last 15 years and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I Thanks appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.